Thank you for attending this session. Nice to see so many faces here, both familiar faces and, and new faces. Uh, I'm happy for the support. Uh, as, as Olaf mentioned, this is the topic of my, uh, of my uh, presentation. I'm interested in uh, parents' perspectives on uh, bullying and peer victimization, or maybe also the broader term, <coughs> school violence. And I'm uh, working with this as in a broader project as a part of my dissertation at Stockholm University. And my uh, supervisor is Ankestin Sederborg, who is present here today also, and Carrie Trost is helping me in this work. Uh, I will give a, a broad overall view of uh, the research we are doing, and then more specifically talk about children's disclosure and parents' awareness uh, of the exposure in school. Uh, but to start with, I'm looking, I don't know if you even see the change here, but I'm, I'm looking uh, at complaints uh, that are sent to the child and school student representative in Sweden called Barn och Levombudet, BHO. Uh, so I have been, uh, the first year I, I received a lot of complaints, and the second year I, I tried to read them. It was like 430 complaints, and, and it was uh, constituted of 11,000 documents. So it was an overwhelming first year just to understand what could I do with all this material. Uh, but, but it started to... Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, it started to more and more became clear that uh, what, what I saw as something very interesting in this material was parents' lived experience of their child's exposure, since most of the complaints are done by parents, and uh, parents in, in bullying research in general seems to be the missing voice, at least when it comes to qualitative uh, research, that it's not so much done about parents' perspectives on children's exposure. But, uh, of course, everything is done in the school context, and I think parents' experiences is special there, because they are not very often in that school context. They are at home. So we have this interaction between different sites, where the child becomes a student in school, and, and relates to peers and teachers, and then come home, and uh, we have a parent-child interaction about things that are going on in school. Uh, so I, I've been reading through uh, almost half of the we excluded material that weren't really completed and were not written by, by parents and others. And, and we had two questions, like what, how does an parents understand this kind of exposure? And what is the reactions and responses from children? Uh, I will not go, in, go into detail there, but um, uh, the occurring themes in, in these 230 cases that, that we have read is, is a little bit picture here. Uh, of course, there is a lot of uh, information about child peer victimization and patterns of, of violence, and the children's responses to that violence as, uh, as uh, health issues or, or agency or defense or different kinds of victimization processes um, in the middle there. And, and for, uh, for some families and children, there it will also affect the family, and the parents will uh, doing something I call an, an emergency exit. They will either keep their children at home or they will transfer to another school or they will even change town. Sometimes the exposure stops then, sometimes not. Um, and this is also, of course, related to what is the school doing or not doing? How, how does the school take their responsibility? And how are they responding to this victimization and response according to the parents? So I just, I just take the parent perspectives on this. This is in the complaints, you will find a lot of conflicts and different um, voices about this, but, uh, but I choose to, to put my feet there during this dissertation, since it's such an overwhelming um, material. So what I try to focus on today will be this first part, like how do parents become aware? Uh, how do they find out that their child are exposed in school, since we know that children are not disclosing in general so much to adults at all, um, and maybe more to parents than to teachers? and very often also to friends. So how do parents get involved? And this is also interesting from the um, from, from kind of a policy intervention perspective. You can, you can look upon BEO as a, as a national authority that uh, try to see if the school law is also fulfilled in practice in schools. But they have to be, be aware also about when, it, when it's not, so to say. And that is very often through parents. And so how do parents then get to know this? So that, that's like a chain of, of information uh, in this material. So that felt like a good starting point, point at least. So uh, the first um, study we are making and the first article that this, this presentation is a little bit a tentative result from. We are not finished with the article, but we are in the 
middle of writing the results and start to engage in a dialogue with the wider scientific community what our empirically founded uh, results could mean in relation to other, other research in this field. So our objective then when it comes to this study is that the overall aim is to explore how parents become aware of their child's school violence, victimization. More specifically, how do they report their children's disclosure in complaints to the child and school student representatives. Our project draws on natural occurring data and is based on parents' own written accounts from 104 cases of complaints, those cases that included uh, descriptions of disc disclosure or parental awareness in some way. Uh, it's an explorative study and we are using an inductive approach within, within an interpretative phenomenological framework. And what does that mean? That means that we have stayed very close to the text. We start by reading it closely, 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 and see what, what is here, what, what kind of descriptions can we find? And after that, you, you generate themes and, sub and over, overall themes to see uh, what, what is this. And then start, and in the next step, start to see, okay, what kind of theoretical implications does this have? So it's empirically grounded in that way. And, and phenomenological uh, framework is also to to see, to see what kind of meanings does parents make in these materials and what is, what is their lived experiences. So that is guiding for the analysis. Um, so this is the tentative results. And uh, we have overall like superordinate themes and sub-themes of them. So this seems to be paths to parental awareness. Of course, children's spontaneous disclosure the child is uh, sometimes just picking up the phone in school, sometimes from uh, the toilet where they are like, seeking shelter and calling their parents and say, they are doing this and that to me, listen, and holds up the phone. And then you can hear people are banging on the door outside. Uh, so, so that gi gives a very immediate uh, information to the parent. Okay, you're sitting here now and it's happening now and you're at the toilet and I have you in the phone. Uh, so what to do? So that is a kind of immediate. But it could also be after the occurrence of the, the situation, but also through a, through a text like, help me, I don't want to be here anymore, or something like that. A lot of these. Uh, but also face-to-face -face disclosure, coming home, maybe on the way home from school, or coming home and meeting the parent when the parent is available, and starting to tell what has happened in school uh, on, a, on a spontaneous way where it comes from the child. So we, if the to this is overlapping themes, so if, the to if we have 104 cases, you can see that we have about more than half is uh, this kind of spontaneous disclosures. But it's also, of course, a lot of withholding. There is resistance and barriers to disclose for the child to the parents. So we have delayed disclosure, where, where they are not telling anything for, for a couple of days, couple of weeks, and all, all of a sudden they are telling everything. So it comes like a little bit like an outburst, crying and thinking like, oh, this is... And then the parent understands, oh, that's why uh, this has been going on in a way. But now I understand. So that's a delayed disclosure. Partial, they, they tell bits and pieces, not everything. Um, maybe they say, I don't want to talk about it because it too, it's too horrible. So you know something, but you know, don't know the worst. And some, they never say anything. You just know that something is wrong, but you don't get uh, disclosure from the child. And that, uh, that, go, that moves on to the next uh, subordinate theme of parental discovery. Uh, because if, if children just, if they make something spontaneous, then parent knows, but they can be suspicious anyway. Uh, but if they withhold or non, not disclosing, then they start maybe to monitoring. Okay, what is, what is going on here? They're monitoring like, emotional responses or bodily responses or something wrong with my child and what could that be? Um, or they start even to make this kind of parental solicitation where they uh, ask questions that can be kind of intrusive to the child and sometimes the child just resists that and doesn't say anything anyway, but, it, but it's also a pattern. Um, that could, solicitation is very common when someone comes home with you know, a, a bruise or an injury and you, or you, you discover that something, something happened to their bodies if they are small children, um, then parents, of course, will start to ask. But there could also be external revelation, uh, information from the school, someone else than the child tells the parent, or information from other parents or children. So that, that is the major paths um, in the material. 
But we also have been interested in, uh, we asked the, the questions of, okay, so how is the children responding in this? And what, what, what is their, uh, what, what's happening here? And you can say uh, this is also a, a more of a parallel theme that goes all through these paths, uh, where, where children are <laughs> emotionally responding in an overwhelming amount of, of cases and also bodily responses. And that could be they can't sleep or they have, they have pain in their stomach or something more uh, somatic or psychosomatic. Um, so that, I that is apparent in the, in the text. Oh, I have to learn that I should push the opposite button. Uh, and, uh, and also, um, sorry, <laughs> and also the reluctance to disclose, the resistance and the barriers that could also be seen as contextual factors is something that we have looked at. This is brief time to talk about 100 cases, you know, of very many incidents and disclosure. But I, I will just, this is the overall picture of the material, and I will walk you through uh, some examples um, to give you an idea. Uh, this is the writing, because it's written material, of the mother of Gunnel, who Gunnel is 11 years old. Um, and she, she writes like this. We wanted to transfer school even at that time. Gunnar was very low in spirit that year and had neither self-esteem nor self-confidence. Woke up several times at night and could shout straight out. And one day she got an outburst here at home where she yelled and cried, got dark eyes and kicked at everything, shouted no one wanted her clothes. Her dad had to hold her for 30 minutes before she got calm. There we really became worried and I broke totally together. So, um, if we look at this a little bit piece by piece, this could be seen as a face-to-face -face disclosure, even though it's kind of intrusive, waking up at night and, and shouting, uh, and also having this kind of outburst uh, at home. Mm. But there's also a lot of bodily and emotional responses to this relational exclusion that uh, Ganas is exposed to, um, both when it comes to waking up and... and um, running around and getting dark eyes, and, and the emotional part is uh, this, um, getting this outburst and yelled and cried. But there is, of course, also a, a parental response to that, um, and I just call that being a parent here. Like, her dad had to hold her for 30 minutes before she got calm, or there, there we really became worried and I broke totally together. So there is also emotional responses from the, from the parents, or responses to do something for your child. Uh, and we wanted to transfer school even at that time. So when they write, they, they al already have transferred school. Um, so that could be seen as responses of parents and also saying something of parents' lived experiences of, uh, of having a child who is exposed and disclosed. Mm. This is both the delayed and non and partial disclosure um, because before this incident, uh, the mother of Vincent, who is 13 years old, um, had some bits and pieces of what was going on, but then she, she writes this. On Friday, my son tried to commit suicide by hanging himself in one of the school toilets. Thank goodness he failed. He was at the school nurse afterwards, but did not say what had happened, but gave another explanation for the injuries of the neck. He also said nothing to us, but gave us uh, as well, a story about the neck injury that sounded credible. We did not find out what happened until the evening when the teacher called home. Then a student in the son's class had told what happened to his parents, and the parent called the teacher. I was very shocked, so we did not talk about the bullying at that time. But I assumed that the school was going to talk to the accused police, and we were at the child's psychiatry emergency unit with the son, and the psychologist who spoke to him said he had been very degraded and beaten at school, and that the best thing for him was to rest out at home and to start at another school. Um, yeah, so what is, what is going on here? Um, there is a non-disclosure. The parents don't know this. He ha even though he has uh, signs on his neck, he says something else. Uh, so the child is resisting to tell, even though he has told something before. It. Um, and this is what uh, the fourth team, the external revelation, someone else tells. And that is also a chain of responses, not from the teachers who has been called by a student or another parent. You know, it's many people who are, who are, do, who are responding to this. Um, and, yeah, emotional responses. 
Um, this could be seen as an emotional response of a child um, to many things, of course. He, he has been, she has been talking earlier in the complaint that her son has said that he, he felt like failure uh, because of the bullying and exposure. So, so is it as a response to that feeling of being a failure or is it a response to, uh, to the violence? Um, that's a little bit speculative, but, but it's a, a definitely a response, or an emotional response. Mm. There's also barriers to, to disclose. And here the mother writes that she became very shocked. Uh, so they didn't talk about the bullying. So sometimes also uh, uh, the response of the parent to this can also be, become a barrier to disclose, uh, or, or other barriers, but just in this excerpt. Um, and this is a little bit about also what it means to be a parent, uh, to a child who disclose something, uh, or a sh child who doesn't disclose, but you, you reveal the information for someone else. Um, bringing, bringing the child to the child psychiatry and, and getting this information and, and thanking, thanking that he didn't commit suicide. Um, and change school, they also did. So, um, the last example of the mother of Marita. Uh, Marita received nasty messages on Kik. This, um, yeah, maybe people know that it's a kind of a, you, you, you text each other through that, uh, which I showed in my turn for Marita's mentor. Marita did not show me the message, but kept it a secret. But I saw that she felt terrible. She could not sleep, worried, mood swings, stomach ache, etc. In the evening, I opened her message and read everything, and then I cried myself to sleep. It was all that Marita was tiresome, she has no friends, nobody likes her, you should just know what Annika is talking about, another girl in the school. Uh, are you crying now, etc.? I showed the mentor the messages the following week. Um, so, this is, a, this is an example of, of non-disclosure and resisting to tell. She didn't not show those messages for her mom. Um, but there is also um, a piece here of parental monitoring, bodily and emotional responses. So the parents are uh, suspicious in a way uh, and starts to monitoring this and use this also as information that something is wrong. Um, because the, her response to that is to open, open the phone and, and read about this herself uh, and also acting on that and talking to the, to the school professionals. We don't know much about if, if her daughter was involved in this, but if you read this you can at least maybe conclude that uh, she didn't involve her daughter at, uh, immediately because she cried herself to sleep. Um, so sh that was something she did on her own a bit. So, uh, yeah, this is maybe a lot to grasp. But this is some examples. Some, uh, in the article we have uh, more examples to give all the nuances of this, but this is three examples that give at least a, an insight in the themes that we, uh, we are talking about. And this is really a tentative conclusion because it's really a work in progress. But uh, in some, children's disclosure and parental awareness, two sides of the same coin. They are deeply interrelated. Um, children disclosure with by mobile or face-to-face, -face, they could be delayed or partial, as I have showed here, or none at all. Um, and parents are monitoring or solicitating or getting revelation or information from others. And in between this, we have children's emotional and bodily responses, resist resistance and barriers that is uh, a way of, of uh, communicating also, and an important form of information that is that is also uh, available for the parent. And I'm, uh, when I've been reading all this, I, um, I think also that we have to think about disclosure in uh, another way, not, not just as something that someone tells, tells or not tells, that it's also about how, uh, what hap how people are communicating also emotionally and bodily. Uh, and we will write more about that, but here we are right now. I am very grateful for uh, ideas or suggestions that uh, connect these results to, to the wider community of research, so, or questions or thoughts in general, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.